understanding is that he's talking to UBCM. That UBCM is not tracking the current implementation status of the completed plans. My understanding is that the Ministry of Forests isn't tracking the implementation of completed wildfire protection plans. Is that correct? So when a community has a wildfire protection plan in place, uh, then we have access to that information and if there's a fire in the area, that plan immediately comes into play. So to say, you know, is, is it tracked, a wildfire protection plan, uh, I'll go back to Prince George just as an example. Um, Prince George did a, a very good job in the development of a wildfire uh, protection plan. Uh, the, the, they have expended, I think, in the neighborhood of about $6 million already in reducing uh, fuel loading, but they still have likely another three, four, five million dollars to spend. And Prince George is probably the community that's farthest ahead of anyone in the province in terms of managing uh, their fuel strategy. So it's not, my point in telling you that is it's not something that you kind of turn on or turn off. Uh, fuel mitigation is something that you never get to an end time because when you've kind of swept the bush, if your objective is to remove, remove fuel loading from the forest floor, by the time you get through the area that you do, you're gonna go back to the beginning and you're gonna start all over again. So it's not, a, it's not something you can put a tick mark in a box and say we've accomplished that. Sure, but there are some areas where there can be tick marks in certain boxes. Uh, for example, up in Whistler, they have a number of recommendations, a number of key recommendations in their plan, which have not been implemented. And this ranges from fuel treatment to buying of a sprinkler system, the kind of sprinkler system that you just mentioned. So what I'm wondering, and just to be clear, the ministry is not tracking the implementation of those completed plans. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. So what happens is if there's a fire in the community, then immediately when we come into action, that plan gets rolled out and that's how we address but for the actual part fire. The, but for the most part, those plans are meant to be preventative. They're not actually meant to be... Mm -hmm. In, in a lot of cases, a lot of the recommendations deal with preventative actions, not you know emergency actions for the most mm -hmm. part, right? But, so. but they very much are both. And you know, really effective, depending on where you live in the province, and I, I'm happy to speak to Whistler actually, but depending on where you live in the province, a, a lot of the times, you know, there's not much you're going to do in terms of fuel uh, reduction strategies. There's, you know, minimal fuel. If you look down at California, example, the grass fires and that type of thing, it's not like you're going to go through and sweep all the grass from the uh, from the, the ground. That's, you know, just the reality of the area that they live in. Sure. So, you know, the uh, part of it is how do you attack those fires? What's the best management strategies? How do you communicate together? How do you make sure that one group Group isn't doing something that's counterproductive or interfering with another group. You know, one of one of the um, uh, real success stories again this year was our early attack on the Glen Rosa fire uh, from our tanker bases. Um, the uh, in previous years, if we weren't communicating effectively, if you had ground crews. Uh, from the local fire department, you couldn't bring in your aircraft uh, to attack those fires and lay in the retardant lines uh, that we did in the early stages of the Glen Rosa fire because uh, you didn't know where people were at on the ground. You didn't have that level of communication. Now with the level of communication that we've got, uh, we're able to do that and that's directly part of the wildfire management plan. So that's a key strategy so that you get those tankers on the ground you get the retardant lines in, you make sure that that's your first line of defense uh, in, in each fire, and then you allow the, the heavy lift helicopters to come in and start bucketing and you attack it. So, you and know, I it's, certainly, uh, like, I certainly understand that there has been success in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, you know, uh, an approach dealing with these fires when they actually do happen. There has certainly been success in that front. Um, but I guess I go back to the the preventative point of mm -hmm. these community wildfire protection plans. You've contributed all this money to UBCM uh, to get these plans written, and yet no one seems to be tracking whether or not they're actually implemented, which one would assume would be the whole entire point of having mm -hmm. a plan. Uh, so I guess I'm just wondering whether or not you think that's a problem. Well, you know, these are locally elected officials, uh, locally elected councils, and as uh, someone who lives in Prince George, uh, I would expect that my uh, my mayor and council would be uh, uh, delivering on a protection plan, so plan once they funded it. So, you know, I, I think each, you know, I'm not sure that it's our job to hold each of these communities' hands as we go through this process. 
Um, you know, I think that many people would see it as interfering as big government stepping on little government uh, in the process. So, you know, everyone needs to, one, one of the things that Philman said very clearly in the report uh, was that, that this was not a problem that any single level of government or any single group of people uh, could uh, uh, could react to. It required local communities, uh, local government, private individuals, the provincial government, federal government, everyone needed to play a role in this in this, uh, in this this thing. So, you know, I think when you take a step back to Philman and ask yourself that equation, how do you respond to that? It really does say that, you know, everyone needs to be part of it. But flowing from that then, it, it seems like well, as a result, you guys don't have any idea about how a lot, how prepared a lot of communities are on the ground for wildfires across British Columbia. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd challenge that. I mean, I think we have a pretty good handle on. We, you know, we know who has plans in place. Uh, we know uh, who the key well, contacts. Not the, um, they're implemented, though. Yeah, well, but we know who the key contact points are with right. each of the various. Uh, in each of the various communities. So, if we need, to, you know, if we have a fire that erupts in an area. Uh, then we're able to go and, and deal directly with that individual very short period of time. I mean, literally, it's minutes, right? It's not it's not hours or or uh, days or weeks or, or months. It's literally within minutes. We're able to, to talk to that person. They're able to say to us, "No, we've done our field treatment in, in that area. We're in good shape over here. We've got a problem." As you're attacking the the fire lines, here's the areas that you need to stay focused on. So, you know, and these are all living documents. They're not documents that uh, are, are again things that you kind of put a tick mark beside them and then you file them. Uh, you know, each uh, I'll give you an example in in Wells. Uh, Wells Barkerville, uh, we just authorized uh, just under, I think it was about $800,000 uh, in fuel mitigation money through the Job Opportunities Program, which has been 100% funded. So that isn't one that requires any uh, any shared funding at all. And uh, there's going to be forest workers working around uh, Barkerville to do some fuel mitigation work. So, you know, that's not something we'd, we'd, we'd necessarily be able to identify quickly or, or notify uh, our, our firefighters, but having the key contact person knowing how to do that communication. Now, I think what you're suggesting uh, makes sense in terms of developing um, a, uh, a live database system that can talk to each other uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that we have the most current information in real time. So we're not there yet. I think it's an, an interesting concept, and we may have to call it the Holman proposal uh, <laughs> if it uh, if it gets to uh, implementation. And then, like the Lobbyist Registration Act amendment, is going to be called the, the Holman yeah. principle. Yeah, the Holman but uh, so it's it's we're not there yet. We yeah. still rely on the old-fashioned system uh, to communicate. But uh, but you know, I think it's an interesting idea that could be incorporated.